Allora, uh, qui, uh, uh, who is uh, here? Uh, my name is Bertrand Peccary, I am French. Uh, I am the director of the Global Editors Network. It is the worldwide association of editors in chief. Uh, what is different, uh, we were, all of us were part of different associations, very vertical association. Uh, the World Association of Newspaper, EBU, the European Broadcast Union. Uh, here, Mario is part of ONA, uh, Online News Association. So you have very vertical uh, association based on platforms. And the basic idea of the Global Editors Network is to say uh, we need to be transversal. And so uh, we have editors in chief from BBC, CNN, uh, from major newspapers as Le Monde, La, as Le Monde, The Guardian. Uh, New York Times, and we have uh, also pure players, uh, Huffington Post, for, 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 for instance. So th this is the idea of the Global Editors Network, and uh, uh, we, we are uh, working on storytelling, and it is a reason why we are managing this uh, session on live blogging. Uh, close to uh, here, uh, and he will be the first speaker, Aaron Pilofer, so in ch editor of interactive news at New York Times. Uh, so one, uh, one of the major news sites uh, uh, with uh, Huffington Post, I think you are, we, <laughs> we are uh, struggling with them to be the first uh, uh, news uh, website in, in the US. Uh, and so uh, a, a long tradition of live blogging, evidently. Uh, close to me, um, Douglas Arellanes. He's uh, um, business no. Director, of innovation. Director of innovation at Source Fabric. They are developing uh, their own uh, CMS, content management systems, hair time, or the live desk, and they, they have, uh, we have worked together for uh, the Gen Live Desk, uh, Gen and, um, and Source Fabric for developing uh, a new generation of live blogging tool. And uh, so he will present uh, this uh, live blo uh, blogging tool, something very practical. And then Mario, so I think I don't have to introduce uh, Mario Tedeschi, Ni Lali from La Repubblica, Grupo Espresso, and uh, uh, they have a, a long tradition of live blogging, uh, not only uh, through the national newspaper, but also with the chain of local 17, 18? 18 uh, newspapers. So you will have uh, very different experiences. And uh, as an introduction before, giving the floor to, uh, to Aaron, I would say that uh, live blogging is really linked to storytelling. And the goal of this session is to check if uh, really the, the traditional article is dead or not, if live blogging just a complement of traditional articles or replacing articles, because there is a debate uh, on, on that, and uh, and also uh, uh, a few words about the history of live blogging. So everybody started uh, with live blogging when the internet started. It's not new. Live blogging is not new at all. Uh, I remember I covered for Liberation in, in France the Tour de France in 95, 1995, and evidently we used uh, the, the classical internet, the classical internet for saying at uh, 5.15, 5.17, 5.20, uh, it was live blogging, but we never <laughs> used this word. Of, uh, so live blogging uh, uh, for covering sports events uh, is very classical. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, it, it was not replacing uh, classical articles. There was no competition or no idea of uh, having something special. Uh, there, in the history of live blogging, you have really 
three major changes uh, uh, for, for having something today sophisticated, uh, to have something quite uh, exhaustive. First is the explosion of social media, that the fact you can add Twitter feeds, you can add Facebook pages, you can add comments from the users is totally new. The, here the storytelling is no longer the story of a, a journalist, of a person, of a team, a, a, a newsroom. Suddenly it becomes another, uh, another story uh, because you can add as many as uh, comments, uh, new facts, when they are checked, uh, to the story. And, and, the, and, and you read differently uh, this article, just because they, it's cut, they are cut, with many, many persons involved in the same, in the same story. So social media was the first uh, revolution for, um, uh, for live blogging. The second revolution is, is, is clearly commercial. Uh, you have uh, some, some uh, commercial outlets, some co uh, startups uh, made their business with live blogging. And we can quote uh, Scribble Live, uh, I think it is used by uh, La Repubblica. Uh, we can quote uh, Cover It Live, we can quote uh, Source Fabric. So uh, you can make business with live blogging. Why? It's not really the, it's not really the software. Software are, are quite similar, even if uh, Douglas will tell something different, but it's about the, uh, the servers. Uh, you can, uh, during an election day, during the election of the Pope, you can have one million people uh, on your servers, and here is the difference. Z those firms, Scribble Live, Covert Live, what they offer to a newspaper, to a television, to a, uh, a media company, this is uh, the capacity of traffic. And I will take an example. In France, during the election day uh, last May, May 2012, uh, it crashed. So if you don't have the, the big servers, but really big, uh, live blogging is dead. It's not, so the question of technology is very important. It was a second revolution. And I think really the, the birthday of live blogging as, as, you, as you know it is uh, during the Arab Spring. And here the best example is how Al Jazeera took uh, took the thing during, uh, uh, not, uh, not really during the Tunisia uh, revolution, but during the, Alt, uh, uh, during the Egyptian uh, revolution and uh, Al Tahrir uh, Square. Uh, here you had not only the live video from Al Tahrir Square, but they were welcoming comments, they were welcoming uh, really using live blogging as a way to cover a revolution. And until now, it, 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 it was a model. It was new, and all newsrooms uh, took advantage of this coverage. Uh, and and the, 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 the TV guy from Al Jazeera worked very closely with the social media editor. And maybe, Aaron, it is a transition. With the Boston bombing, maybe you can explain us uh, how New York Times uh, covered uh, covered that. W what was different between uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the Tahrir Square two years ago and uh, and uh, and this story uh, uh, about uh, Boston, the B Boston blasts and the um, Boston story, uh, Boston story. So it was just an introduction to tell you that live blogging is really uh, an interesting story and uh, you have business, you have readers, you have users, you have interaction, so it is part of the digital uh, revolution. Uh, so, Aaron. Great, uh, thank you, I'm glad to be here. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about 
who I am and the team that I run at the New York Times and why I'm talking about live blogging today. So I am editor of Interactive News. I run a team that does, well, used to, I always say three things, but now it's four things as of this month. Uh, first, I started a team in the newsroom about six, almost seven years ago now uh, that combines technologists and journalism. So we, we basically build the things that our CMS cannot. Um, and we provide for the newsroom the ability to tell stories in ways that um, we're very, very lucky and that we can create things, new platforms, new storytelling devices that uh, um, most newsrooms don't have the capability to do. And so today I'm going to show you how we've um, been iterating on this idea of, of a live blog and, and extending it in some interesting, I think, interesting ways. I also run uh, the social media team uh, at the New York Times, the social media and the community teams at the New York Times. That's our comment desk, but also seven journalists who are, uh, including a social media editor, who manage our, our presence on social. But be, more than that, they're really focused on projects that are around engagement. And um, often, we're actually considering changing the name of the team because more of the work that they do is focused on projects that uh, reflect conversation on nytimes.com, uh, bringing in the conversation from social, um, casting out and bringing people back than it is about, you know, tweeting and, and managing accounts. And finally, uh, just this month, I started a team uh, around newsroom analytics that I will not talk about at all today. Um, today, though, I want to talk about this, which is our... Um, uh, and I apologize, I don't have internet here, so I'm only going to be showing you images which are going to be uh, less than fantastic, but you'll get the idea. Um, this is our Oscar night uh, dashboard, and effectively it's a live blog, but kind of a live blog on steroids. Um, we started this about five years ago. This is the fifth iteration of it, and it's really where my team became interested in, in, in live blogging. Um, the previous versions of live blogs were very, very boring, I mean, to be quite honest. From a, from a design standpoint, they were very dull. They were just like strings of text. They didn't really have any life to them. And we wanted to, 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 to do more with them. We wanted to bring in outside um, media. We wanted to reflect the conversation from social. But most importantly, we wanted it to be interactive. So in our case, we've taken live blogging and tried to make it into more of a true sort of second screen experience. And I know that's very much a buzzword in the journalism world. But for us, that's, we found this to be very, very successful. So here you see on the top um, a live video stream of uh, uh, David Carr, a media columnist, and, and A.O. Scott, our chief media uh, film critic, during, during Oscar night. And we did this in, I'm sure nobody here has seen this, but if you maybe on the off chance you've seen this uh, show, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, it's a comedian who would uh, sit in front of a lot of bad movies and make very funny comments during the actual event. And anyone who's ever watched an Oscar, uh, uh, perform uh, Oscar night uh, knows that it is really ripe for that sort of presentation, particularly last year's with Seth MacFarlane. So that's what they were doing all night. But the problem with video, much like um, some of the other multimedia that we, we do, is it often sits separate from the content. It's like an add-on to the content. We didn't want that. We wanted to have a complete experience. So in this case, the live blog is going below, the video is going constantly through the night, and then on the right you see uh, sort of a Twitter uh, module. Now what we were doing is we were actually posing questions. David and Tony were actually talking to our, our, our um, uh, folks on social saying, hey, so in this case, which nominated film will go down as the most overlooked? And then we were bringing those responses back. This wasn't just a, a, a raw feed. This was something that we were actually curating and bringing on. So there was very much of a two-way kind of Q&A going on between the hosts and social media, and then throughout the night you saw uh, uh, the, the live blog going. We also um, wanted to make this very much an interactive experience for readers. So we have done for, again, the past five years a, a, an electronic online ballot that you could come before the Oscars and you could pick who you think you're going to win in each category. And then on Oscar night when you come back, you log in, and you can see on the right side, as you can see, this is my ballot. I did horribly. 
Uh, I got, I think, eight out of 24 right, so I'm terrible at this. But um, it was scoring this in, in real time. And we would pipe through, if you can see um, there at 11.43, you can see that we would pipe through the, the answers. And, and in some cases, we would like say, you got it right, you got it wrong. So it was also a kind of a personalized experience, more as much as it was anything else. So this is what we're really interested in, is creating a live blogging experience that actually is very interactive. It recognizes that we are not the only voice, we are not the only conversation. It brings that in in some way, but it also provides a sort of a two-way conversation with, with readers. And design-wise, uh, if you could see our old live blog design, it is horrendous. This is a much nicer uh, experience. Um, again, this is an example from uh, another example of what we call the dashboard from uh, a presidential debate. This video streaming in the upper right, again, is the debate going on, the live blog going down the middle. But then on the right, we're doing real time, essentially fact checking uh, with Q&A with readers. So you can't really see it in this view. But as this is going on, we're asking readers to say, you know, wait a minute. Uh, Mitt Romney just said something that doesn't seem right to me, or Barack Obama just said, is that right? And then sending this on, into us, and we had a team of reporters who were standing by doing nothing but responding to those questions in real time, sort of fact checking in real time. And then, and this is important, that the answers were then piped back into the feed with the actual question and the person who asked it. So you get this idea, again, of kind of a two-way experience where we're adding more than just sort of this voice of God stream of text, here's what we think, we don't care what you think kind of attitude um, that unfortunately pervades much of, of journalism. Here's our um, election night version of the dashboard, uh, more data heavy with a lot of results. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about Sandy, uh, our coverage of Sandy and Boston um, tomorrow. Uh, I'm on a panel where we're going to talk about covering um, disasters, so I'm not going to go into much detail. But again, here during Hurricane Sandy, when people come to us, they're coming to us with a very different uh, mindset. Um, when a hurricane is, is screaming full speed at New York City, we are then, in many cases, not just a source of information, we are at times almost a lifeline. They're turning to us for information that potentially could save lives. And, and we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Now, in, an, in sort of the old school uh, way of covering an event like this, what we would do is we would write the classic sort of lead all story. Uh, we would keep updating that through the day. And then at the end of the day, that story would go in the newspaper. And then what would we do the next morning? Start a new one. Well, that's a terrible way to cover an event uh, like this, where what people want to know is pretty much two things. What's going on right now that I need to know? Live blog is a particularly good device for this. So I kind of think of live blogging in a case like, like Sandy to be almost a, not exactly a new story form, but not, not a new story form. You know, they say journalism is the first draft of history. I think in some cases a blog like this is the first draft of journalism, where you can see uh, reporters quickly posting things, little bits of information immediately, bringing in important bits of information from outside, curating social media channels, and getting that out to the public as quickly as possible. Uh, and much of that will end up, of course, in the next day's story. And because we own this platform, we can do things like the, the uh, status um, uh, update chart on the right, where you can quickly see the status of electricity in, in New York City, um, water, uh, the bus system, um, you know, the kinds of things you want to know right now. Now, I'm going to admit to you, we did not come up with this idea. We stole it completely from WNYC, um, <laughs> the local uh, public radio affiliate. But uh, they had this, and we were like, oh my god, head slap. We have to have this. Why not? So just, I, I need to give full credit where credit is due. And then finally, for Boston, we approached this a little more traditionally. Oh, one last thing about Sandy, sorry. This was the first time we had tried to do um, a multi-day live blog. And actually, Sandy's an interesting experiment for us because I mentioned earlier sort of the traditional approach to a story like this is the lead-all that we would write through. We didn't do it for Sandy. 
this was the story that led the website actually for seven, pretty much seven straight days. This was the main story that we were pushing people to. So it has become more than just sort of an extra thing for us. This was what we were pushing people but to. It wasn't in the front page? Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. It was then going there. led the website, yes, yes. yeah, right from the website. And believe me, running because we are running those servers and because we wrote that software, we were like, please God, do not crash, you know. And, and which? It didn't crash. Which CMS, it was developed this by? This is, well, the, the, the front end piece and everything that you see here is a um, combination of Ruby on Rails, Node.js, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, stuff we wrote, but it's being driven off of a feed generated from WordPress. Um, and finally, for Boston, we did a little more traditional. We ran, we, we, we anchored our coverage on, we have a breaking news blog called The Lead. We anchored the coverage there, but we used basic modules that we had developed um, for Sandy. So you can see in the middle there, here's our live coverage module. That stayed up through the event, and that updates very quickly, which we're actually not capable of doing um, on the homepage very, very well. Um, this was constantly updating with information. And then we're also piping that directly into other places. In fact, the mobile phone here is even harder to update in real time, which is why having that ability is so important. Um, that's the version of that in, the, in mobile. And I think with that, I am now done. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aaron. So you could see uh, how big media are really using um, um, live blogging. Uh, now, uh, the Italian experience, and uh, Mario, you have the floor. Thank you. That works. Right. Uh, you were saying, and then Aaron again said, are this uh, live blogging, whatever, going to replace articles, or uh, this new article, that's what you said, and somehow, you know, uh, the New York Times experience with Senate is, uh, in fact, that was our story for seven days. Uh, I think this is something that goes back quite a while, even before, you know, uh, blogging was even a word we knew. Uh, Repubblica had a sort of, we called it diretta, which is live reporting, uh, back in, at the end of the 90s. You know, of course, short burst of text in HTML, uh, it was as brutal as that. Uh, and, but then it, uh, and it was, you know, something that in, in this country was, kind of invented by us, both for sporting event or running political events or, you know, developing stories. Uh, and this became a feature of the website. Uh, personally, I think they even overused it, but <laughs> which sometimes happens, you know, when you get, when you fall in love with a, one of the tools. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, a, a very typical feature of, 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 the, of the website of La Republic, which is, by the way, the number web, number web, number one news website here. And, uh, and then it, you know, it, all, it developed a number of other sub-tools for sporting events, uh, using you know, data for sporting events, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And then uh, we added uh, a layer of actual live blogging with Scribble Live a few months ago, and uh, which did not replace the other, you know, in-house, more, shall we say, editorial tools, uh, live editorial tools, uh, but uh, allowed us on breaking news, continuing stories, and so on, uh, to not only um, leverage our own uh, resources, editorial resources, uh, reporters on the field, and. Uh, uh, editorial know-how and knowledge in the newsroom and so on, uh, but also, you know, other sources, you know, what, you know, uh, uh, the public or other news sources were saying and, uh, or um, telling the people. And uh, this has had, a, you know, an interesting uh, consequence on, on the let me call it the legacy newsroom, which we still have, uh, because suddenly reporters, uh, especially political reporters, in you know, the last few months we had, we're still in the midst of a, quite a large political crisis, 
and suddenly they discovered that you know they were actually were heard, their voices were heard while things were happening, and which is not bad. And they were all excited about that. Uh, but we also, and uh, if if you have any questions about uh, how we do it and so on, uh, Raffaella Menichini, who's the editor in charge of this, uh, is here in the front row, we can, and she can help us or help you afterwards and. Uh, let you know how she and they are doing this. And of course, you know, major events like the election of the Pope or uh, the political, uh, political crisis or major international events like the Boston bombings. Uh, in that case, for instance, they leveraged the possibility of integrating uh, and syndicating the live blogging of the Boston Globe, for instance. And which, uh, I don't know whether this is what you would call multi-newsroom uh, live blogging. Uh, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the name until a few days ago, but I know that's what it did. And, uh, but perhaps a more interesting instance of uh, multi-newsroom multi uh, live blogging is what we are experiencing with, uh, in another part of our company, uh, Group Espresso, that's a pretty large company, and Republic, of course, is the uh, flagship newspaper, but we do have a chain of 18 local newspapers, uh, which is quite large, and, and they have their own, of course, digi digital shows and uh, websites and so on, and, uh, um, and they have a national newsroom that deals with all things national for the local newspapers. And they are uh, uh, using live blogging a lot on three different levels. One is the... Uh, well, traditional, there is a main national and international events they want to follow, just like La Repubblica, and, and they do that. Of course, they have their own staff, they have a staff in the newsroom, they have people on the floor, on the uh, field, and they leverage, you know, the uh, other sources and aggregate it. But it uh, is the same live blogging feed, it is the same uh, page as in La Repubblica. No, 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 no. these are two completely different shows. Okay. So, for instance, for the Pope, they had their, the Republica had their own live blogging, and this outfit, has, you know, this is it. Of course, they are part of the same company. It's like the Boston Globe and, and the New York Times. Uh, they are owned by the same company, but they are two different journalistic and, uh, organizations, right? Okay, so this is these are different uh, journalistic organizations owned by the same company. Okay. Uh, so in this case, of course, if there are major national and international events, they will be uh, set up and managed by the national newsroom. Uh, in certain cases, like, for instance, the national political elections, of course you have a local angle to every you know, uh, story, and especially developing story, because of course, you know, re local results, uh, local politicians be elected or defeated, and, well, you name a number of possible uh, different angles. And so, uh, in that case, they uh, have a national live blogging uh, feed, uh, the, which is syndicated on uh, single pages on their website, so traffic goes to them, and, and it's integrated, can be integrated by local, uh, or curated locally by the newsroom with their own resources and their own angle, of course. I mean, this Italy is, it's, it's, it's a pretty long, not large, but long country. And, you know, an election in uh, Friuli in the Northeast is something quite different from the election in Sicily, even though it's a national election. So, of course, this makes for, you know, different, in, a different uh, uh, way of looking at uh, what's happening. And then, of course, uh, in some cases, uh, local uh, events are uh, followed and uh, covered by a local live blogging, uh, where they use the tool to aggregate stuff other than, or together with, their own people uh, material. Uh, and one interesting thing, I, I don't know, we can ask Raffaella, but I think that uh, while the, uh, shall we say, the uh, reporters on the field usually at La Repubblica, do not use the platform as such. I mean, they don't have, you know, the back end, uh, back end of, uh, of Scribble Live is not used, uh, even though it would be possible, by people on the field. They prefer to go through Twitter with a hashtag 
uh, uh, and, and then feed them, and then, of course, the newsroom would uh, curate it and so on and so forth, edit it and so on. Uh, in the other case, uh, there is, it's a more mixed experience because uh, uh, we do have some reporters on the field using directly, straight, the um, back end of the platform on their mobile tools, while others you know, are more, well, you want to go slow with them, or they want to go slow with it, and uh, and so we use a more you know an indirect way. You know, everybody is on Twitter now. Everybody th seems to think that Twitter is easy, and so we uh, we use it that way. So uh, and basically, what the kind of events we we did, uh, as uh, Rafaela was mentioning before, we had the elections and the election of the Pope in the last uh, few months. And, well, I didn't know that. I learned it just a few minutes ago. The election of the Pope had uh, an impact on traffic and live blogging on, on it was, that was, not, uh, was more than the national elections we had, uh, which you know, tells you a lot perhaps about the country, but probably a lot about the world. I mean, what is really important uh, happening in Rome has not much to do with uh, Italian politics, but with something else. And people, even probably people who uh, are not Italian speakers, would probably just hit the um, La Repubblica's um, live blogging. Uh, you know, you, you get a hunch of what's going on, you get links, you get, uh, you yeah, we can translate stuff. And uh, so this is quite. Uh, I, I would leave it at that, and then, you know, of course, there are problems, and, uh, but we may perhaps uh, talk about that later. Thank you, Mario. So something uh, quite uh, different from uh, New York Times. Uh, now I give the floor to uh, Douglas, uh, Director of Innovation at Source Fabric. So Source Fabric is not a, a media company in the sense that uh, they are not publishers, online publisher or print publishers, so they are producing software, open, I, I, always uh, open uh, software, open source. And, and here, so it is very complementary of the two other speeches because you, you will have um, the point of view of, so, of someone producing the software. And where you, you will see where are the difficulties, you will see uh, wh where are the opportunities. And sometimes uh, a lot of opportunities are, are not taken by journalists yet. And so, uh, Douglas, uh, you have the floor. So it is a more practical part of, of this session. Thank you, Bertrand. Um, I, my name is Douglas Arianes. I'm a recovering journalist. Um, <laughs> I have to confess. Um, I used to work at the LA Times back in the day, and in the 1990s, uh, I uh, left the, the LA Times uh, working for a startup newspaper that my friend started in the Czech Republic. And, uh, oops, let me uh, just get my, my slides up here. Um, so, um, a while ago, I've been, uh, I've started working in the media development field, and one of the things that, uh, that we noticed in working in the, in the area of media development was that uh, a newsroom is the same anywhere in the world. And this is one of the fundamental things that people need to remember, because what happens a lot is that, especially in, uh, when you're on deadline and you're un under uh, the kind of stress that comes with uh, being in a newsroom, um, you tend to think of yourself as being in isolation. And one of the great things for our organization and for myself as a technologist has been to start to recognize the commonalities between newsrooms and between news organizations. Um, because this actually very closely ties with the ethos and the working method that uh, is work used in software development now, which is called open source. And so, what we're doing is trying to bridge together different news organizations because they have the same technological problems. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by actually producing software that we give away for free. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the software that we've got. Um, we all know that newsrooms have li limited resources, and this area is actually uh, important in two, two ways. One is 
that software licenses cost a lot of money, um, as well as the actual ability to develop individual software functionality is something that, again, most newsrooms, unless you're very well resourced, you simply do not have. And so for us, the, the way forward that we have identified is to try to uh, pool together resources as much as possible. Bertrand likes to use the term mutualization, and it means basically a sharing. It's a sharing of know-how, it's a sharing of experience, and it's a sharing of software code. Um, at the same time, I mean, we, we talk a lot about reaching out to social and then bringing them back in. Um, this is something that Aaron pointed out really well. And there is, you have to recognize that these platforms in some ways are both competition and cooperation. They're a tool that we use, but also they, they are working in competition. And so this is another area that we have to recognize and try to work with, but also try to compete against. What is nice to see and what is really a useful thing is that newsrooms have em embraced live blogging. Um, I mean, I suppose the first live blogs were probably operated by Telegraph uh, back in the day. So this is not, again, something that's completely new. I mean, websites, as, we've, as you guys have mentioned, I mean, people have been doing this for the better part of almost 20 years. Um, so the, the idea of the live blog is definitely something uh, that that fits very well with the culture of the newsroom. Now, what is kind of interesting now, especially in the context of, say, WikiLeaks or offshore leaks, is the idea that newsrooms are starting to break out of their, their previous uh, model of isolation, that organizations are actually starting to work together uh, on stories that are too large for them to actually try to solve uh, on their own. And I think that offshore leaks is a very good example of this type of work. It's one of the more recent uh, examples. And so for me, this, this area of collaboration among newsrooms is a, is a pretty interesting uh, and fruitful area of, of exploration. Now, pool coverage is nothing new. Um, every uh, NASA space shuttle launch, every rocket launch, uh, all the coverage from the White House or from very large events is pool coverage. So this is also an area where newsrooms do cooperate together to share the resources so that you don't have 75 camera teams in, uh, in the small White House press room. Um, you just have one and you assign them to provide the coverage and share it to everyone uh, on the given day. And so pool coverage is also another sort of identifier, it's a paradigm that says this is not completely new. So about a year and a half ago, I was approached by Bertrand Pecquerie and uh, the Global Editors Network uh, to start to work on uh, a, a wish list for live blogging. And they had a, a very long set of uh, features and things that they had identified that they liked about various live blogging platforms. And then also some of the things that they didn't like. And one of the things that we were working on was this scenario of a conflict. When we started it was Libya, now it's Syria. But the point is the same. One organization, let's say it's La Repubblica, has one reporter that's in one city. But another newsroom has only one reporter that's in another city. These two reporters can be working in a collaborative manner to share and to pool the kinds of coverage that they have. And this, uh, this is something that we've worked with when trying to build the software uh, that I'll show in just a second. So with, with Jen uh, giving us a specification and a set of uh, the tools that we wanted to create, we actually started to put together uh, some software um, based on, again, 100% open source tools. And this, uh, this software uh, is available. It's up on GitHub for those of you who are software friendly. Um, but uh, what, it, uh, what I would like to show right now is actually something that is, again, a fairly common thing among other competing platforms. And this is the idea of syndication. Um, Storify does this very well. Scribble Live does it very well. Uh, the point is that we can pull together different posts from different places. So if for example, if a reporter at La Repubblica prefers to use Twitter, we can bring that into the discussion. 
If, they, if a reporter prefers to use uh, Instagram to post their photos, then we can pull that into the discussion as well. But at the same time, what, is, what we're starting to work on is the idea that a blog, just like a regular blog has an RSS feed, well, a live blog can also have a feed that serves as a source that you can then aggregate in many different ways. And for us, uh, everything that we're building on is open standards, and so we're using the open JSON standard uh, for this, this communication. Um, in this example, in this graphic that I've got, the idea is that you have two blogs that are working upstream, and they're working as sources for the, the curator downstream to pick and choose which of the posts are most relevant. And so uh, this is something that we think is kind of interesting because it means that you get more coverage, but it also means that you're, you're able to do more with less. And so I actually, now I'm gonna do something that they say never ever do uh, at conferences, which is, I know, <laughs> uh, brave and stupid. Uh, which is actually to show some software running live. And so, uh, bear with me, hopefully this will all work. Um, this is Gen Live Desk. Um, this is our software, and this is available uh, right now on GitHub. You can download this for free, and uh, provided that you have the technical chops, uh, you can uh, go ahead and start to use it. Now, this obviously is a demo, and one of the things that I'm gonna show you is what it looks like uh, what it looks like for uh, a sample user. And so here, uh, this is just a sample website that we've created for this um, with, uh, with some lore on it, some text, and there's our live coverage um, just you know, happening as we see it, right? But uh, what is kind of interesting here is that we can, we can actually draw from multiple different sources. And again, like I say, this is nothing new. Storify does this, uh, Scribble Live does this as well. Um, but for us, what we can do is we can add these new sources really quickly and easily, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the new source. And I mean, you know, we've heard already, I've heard a couple of sessions talking about things like Pinterest or other new emerging platforms. And the point is that if you have one of these platforms that is very popular in your market, you can actually drop in uh, that source uh, fairly quickly and easily. So uh, all I have to do when I'm ready to to bring one of these things in is just click and drag and bring them over. There's a tweet, right, from, uh, from earlier. Let me actually see if I can get some, some live stuff here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is uh, always dangerous, so, so bear with me here. Um, I'm also working, like, twisted around, so I'm... Um, <laughs> so these things are uh, dragged over and we make them live and then we see them live on the page. Now, what is, what is kind of interesting for us here is also that we can do this with visual, uh, visual stuff. So drawing photos from Instagram, uh, thank you. Um, drawing photos from Instagram or uh, drawing them from uh, other things like YouTube, for example, um, when you need to bring them in for your live coverage. Now, what I'll show you here, I'll just uh, go down and show you the chained live blogs. So I've got a test blog set up, and I've shown uh, here are some, some of the posts related to the Boston bombings. And um, one of the things that we were trying to, to sh show here was that we can monitor uh, things that are happening in a remote location and bring them over from one blog to the next. And so, uh, you know, here's someone saying, these people make me sad. Okay, we, we publish, and uh, these things go out live, and then we see them out here on our site. So. Um, the point, uh, thank you, thanks a lot. I'm probably driving the, the interpreter mad. Um, my apologies. The, uh, the point about this is that these, uh, these sources can be placed in multiple places. So uh, for, one, uh, for a, a chain of newspapers, uh, this can be very useful. Um, for wire services, where you have multiple members, uh, we can pool our coverage together and bring it into one place. And so uh, this, uh, this model, I think, is interesting, but what's also most important about this for us is that this is a process. And so a news organization might have one developer in-house. They might not even have a developer. They might reach outside uh, to a, a developer, a programmer, uh, somewhere in their city. Well, 
they can use this platform to serve as a building block for them to work on the software further. And so uh, we really do welcome collaboration in this way. One of the things that people say in the open source world is to scratch your own itch, which means to solve your problems and to, to work on the things that you have that you think are specific to your needs. But what, what we find is that because newsrooms are the same, if this is a pain point for you, it is probably a pain point for someone else. And in this way, we can actually get to uh, a platform that really does uh, uh, fit people's needs faster. One other thing that I wanted to say about the open source model that I think is significant and that Aaron touched on, which is that the, uh, the ownership of the platform is actually a really important part of the whole piece because you may not like the layout that we provide. You may not like the way that uh, the interactions work. And if it's just an embed on a page, then you're kind of stuck using only that. But if you own the platform and you own the way that the, that the information is portrayed on the page, then you have a lot more control over how it is used and how you can make uh, multiple uh, forms of the same thing. And so ownership in this way is really important. <clears throat> and this is, again, one of the strengths of the open source model. And I think that this is what we will, uh, this is going to be one of our strengths for the Live Desk platform as, as it grows. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Douglas. So here it was more practical than the, from the inside uh, world of, uh, uh, of software com and computers. Thank, thank you. Uh, it's almost one hour we are speaking, so I think it's time for you to, to ask questions in the sense that in the second part of the debate, so the last uh, 30 minutes, uh, we will have to uh, evoke, we will have to discuss uh, three main in issues. So the latest trends of live blogging from an editorial point of view. So what do you think here about uh, the changes we will have in the upcoming month and years? I think month because to speak about the future in terms of years in the digital world is quite difficult. So uh, in the upcoming month, uh, we will ask questions about technology and especially servers. So uh, if really the traffic I is increasing du during the live uh, blogging sessions, and it is obvious it is increasing, but what does it change to, to have suddenly uh, 10 times more uh, people uh, on your page, on this specific page of live blogging from a technological point of view. And the last point, because uh, newspapers, uh, broadcasters, uh, they need advertising. What does it mean from a commercial point of view? Are advertisers, do they like uh, breaking news or not? When it is about a crime, when it is about a bombing, maybe not. But in the same time, if the traffic is 10 times more than, uh, than uh, um, usually, uh, it's good for them. So uh, uh, the question will be how to integrate advertising in this kind of uh, live blogging sessions. So, but first, uh, can some, ah, here. Uh, the young lady here. So, if you have questions uh, at this stage of the of the debate, one here. Hello, I'm from the Danish Broadcast Corporation, the website, and we use uh, Scribble Live to our in our live coverage. And I would like to uh, ask Aaron if uh, you have. Uh, what thoughts you have done about uh, the writing in the live blogs? Um, uh, uh, how many people can, how many reporters can blog at the same time from various spaces? If you have, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, great, some big event, uh, can you be in various places? And um, or uh, I. Actually, I would like to, to know if the storytelling is the language, uh, the, the journalism, uh, because I can be uh, a little worried about the journalism if it's only the facts and the, um, 
if if the telling the storytelling is disappearing in the live yeah. blogging hmm. well so there are as you saw we do live blogging for a lot of different kinds of events some of which are breaking news where really truly you just want facts and short bursts of information um, and then sometimes you know for like an Oscars the writing can, the style, the tone can change dramatically. It can be a little bit more sarcastic or snarky or whatever. Um, I think the challenge that we've had and uh, still have to some degree is that the, just like any story form, live blogging demands a certain kind of writing. And you can have the most amazing journalists in the world who can turn a phrase and churn out a 2,500 uh, word uh, uh, masterpiece and cannot write 140 characters to save their lives and and we find this a lot so it's it's it it takes a little while to get people kind of used to the idea that you don't need to write this long in fact that's worse you don't <laughs> want this uh, you want this and, um, you know, brevity in this case is, is kind of the challenge for a lot of our reporters. But there, I think we're getting much, much better at it. And what about the number of reporters? Oh, about the number of reporters. For us, it's really not so much a technical limitation. It's more a limitation on how many people we want to be throwing at a reader at any given time. So we tend to keep it, the number of collaborators pretty low. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I generally, it doesn't get much beyond like four or five. Um, maybe on, a, on an election night we'll have more than that. But we don't, you know, you don't want to have a 27 names just suddenly coming at people like, you know, from all, all sides. You want to have some amount of consistency and some idea of who the heck I'm listening to right now. I mean, the thing about a live blog is it's about as close to broadcast as you can get in the, in the, in the context of text. Um, and, and much like a broadcast, you don't want to have like 19 anchors all like just throwing things at you. It, it, it gets incredibly confusing. So we've tended to keep the numbers pretty low. Something to add, uh, Mario, on that question about the quality of text, uh, if uh, storytelling disappearing through uh, live blogging? Well, if that's a question, I didn't understand the question as being st that. I mean, th if that's a question, the question, of course, is not. Uh, I mean, there are so many different forms of uh, uh, storytelling and uh, uh, journalism making, if I may. Uh, it, uh, the great thing about this uh, circumstances in which we are uh, leaving, professionally speaking, is that, you know, the problem is to choose which one or which ones well, uh, we should be better using in, the, in very specific circumstances. So I, no, I, I think that long uh, form journalism, for instance, uh, has a place to be in digital journalism. I mean, our friends there uh, have been doing and winning Pulitzer Prizes for that. <laughs> and, uh, and we do our own share in this country. Uh, but of course, there are uh, events uh, containing uh, news that uh, ask for a different kind of storytelling. So no, I don't think there is any problem like that. And do, uh, in, in your uh, media organization, do you need specific talents so someone in the future who will be very specific to this kind of live blogging, or for instance, David Carr, so a very well-known journalist uh, at New York Times, uh, media uh, in charge of media, uh, doing everything. He's tweeting, he's doing live blogging, he's doing uh, long articles, uh, long reports, inquiries. Uh, so. I, is there a kind of model in the sense more something more specific I, it's a specific talent or finally no we will take the, the best journalist for for that no I think it, you need a specific I mean it's sort of going back to the question you know not everybody is a great blogger and certainly not everybody's a great live blogger um, we have many who are 
So yeah, there's a definitely a, a, a skill necessary there. Uh, to bring the right sort of uh, social media presence into the, the feed without overwhelming people, you, ha you need somebody who's got the right touch there. So that's almost sort of an editing skill more than, more than anything else. Uh, to, to have a compelling, you know, single screen, single second screen experience, kind of like our Oscars where you have the live video, the related Twitter, and the live blog all working together, which was a very difficult thing to achieve. Uh, you need to both have the technical chops in-house to do that. You need to have somebody who acts as almost, and this ended up being my, my deputy and one of the deputy editors on the culture desk. You need to almost have a, a producer, in the, producer. Not, not in the sense of a web producer, but almost in the sense of a television producer. Yeah, Someone cool. who's going to produce the entire show. Otherwise, it just becomes a sort of cacophony. It's a live show. Yeah, not very much. Uh, uh, l l on, on our side, of course, we, did, uh, we, uh, we have uh, Rafaela is, uh, is, is at La Repubblica is doing that with others. And so, uh, yes, there is, you know, go, it's going, as always, specialization is going to uh, work one way or the other. Hello, my name is Fabio. Um, I work with El Centro, one of the uh, local newspapers in by L'Espresso Group. We we try to get familiar with Scribble Live. We we've been doing live blogging just but with Scribble Live. What I wanted to know if Republica and L'Espresso are actually considering other possible alternatives to Scribble Lives. But why you are not satisfied with? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've, I, I'm a bit familiar with, uh, but um, they, they're probably causing problems with mobile devices, some Samsung, something not like, mm, which is not uh, Apple's stuff. Uh, I, 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 I don't know of any plans right now. I mean, it's, uh, but I don't know wh whether Rafaela has any answer to that. Um, I don't know. Well, frankly, I don't think they're uh, working on uh, in-house uh, system. Right now, we are working more in uh, better um, embedding the Scribble Live platform in our um, in our uh, managing system, as CMS. And um, that's what we're trying to do in order also to keep for the future uh, the um, history of all our um, live bloggings, which is also uh, important. No? And here we touch uh, this question about mobile. Uh, is the future of live blogging uh, talk about the second screen? So how is it possible to have, uh, according to you, uh, Douglas, Aaron, uh, and Mario, uh, is live blogging because uh, what you have shown is quite complex. You have left, middle, right. You have a, 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 you need complementary uh, information. You need inter interactivity. So it works quite well for for a screen, for a big screen. So how do you imagine um, that uh, on uh, tablets and on, on, on smartphones? So for us, I think we learned a lot from Sandy, um, where you know we streamed the exact feed that we had on the web into mobile and iPad, and I think that was a mistake. And the reason is a lot of the things that work, you know, the sort of um, feature, more f sort of featurey things, slightly longer, maybe 500 words, something like that, that work pretty well in a live blog online and a larger screen are terrible on a phone and just don't work at all. So I, I think that the next, if we're sort of looking forward to where we might go with this in future, I think we might create um, a little bit more uh, stratification among the various devices as to we might have a, a more iPhone or phone friendly feed a more, and, a more, and, a, and a feed for a wider screen. And those might have different content the other thing we might, well, we certainly want to do is start taking advantage of what we know about the user. And that may be a logged in user, and we might know quite a bit about them. So we might be able to personalize content a little bit more, you know, more than an Oscar ballot, for example. Like I could think in a, in a sort of breaking news 
uh, uh, situation, if we know where they live or we know where they are, if we can take advantage of, the, of uh, geolocation, we can provide much more contextually relevant information quickly um, uh, to them. So I think those are the two areas we're looking at. Well, of course, uh, uh, mobile, yeah. mobile is the future, it's already the present um, to one extent. Uh, I must tell you, uh, uh, I'm not aware of any major um, new um, product uh, that we are planning, but of course uh, we are thinking about it. I mean, we are still very much uh, web-oriented, and we are aware that that's not enough. F first, okay? screen. Uh, first screen. And uh, <laughs> so this is it. But you know, mobile, uh, in this, uh, speaking about live blogging, uh, has, you know, it's not just on the front end, it's mostly on the back end. I mean, uh, people in the field uh, uh, are using mobile. So uh, we were, you were mentioning uh, possible technical uh, snarls and problems and servers. Well, happily enough, we did not have major server problems in, uh, in the last few years, even though you know, the public was born out of a major uh, uh, crashing success because of the, in the election of 96, it was the first experiment on the web, it went crashing and I said, well, that, there is a market there, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, the problem is bandwidth. You know, especially when, where major events are happening, uh, reporters and people, I mean, just people on the field, the ones you rely on for your information and news, sometimes are just cut off. This is especially true in this country, where you know the bandwidth problem—it's it's a big, big problem—and you know even in major cities, in the central cities. Uh, uh, so that's uh, one, uh, shall we say, technical problems that borders into editorial, because of course you have to perhaps devise a way uh, and uh, you know and find back channels, whatever, uh, carrying pigeons—I don't know—but uh, something that uh, helps you out. Uh, that way. And uh, Douglas, yes, yeah. uh, about mobile developments. I wanted to add a couple of things there. One is that platforms enable, but also platforms limit. And so when you don't own your platform, you don't really have the ability to form how it is, it can be used for the third or fourth screen. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is uh, that because we have open APIs, we're able to actually come up with new solutions. And on the, the point about low bandwidth, uh, in about a week and a half, my colleague and I will be going to uh, Mozambique, where we're going to be deploying this in a citizen journalism context. And there, the primary channel is SMS. And so we have SMS, which we're um, integrating into the system as well, to allow for inputs from uh, citizens, but also potentially from reporters as well. And so if you have a, an open platform, you're able to actually uh, do more with it and, and faster. Okay, and uh, you will change the, the live desk because of, of, of this new platform yeah. Uh, mobile, yeah, based on mobile or, or not? Or do you consider that the structure is here and it is just a, la a layer, um, one more layer? No, everybody has a different experience that they desire. And I think that it's also, uh, what Aaron is pointing to as well is that different types of stories require a different user experience. Um, if you're sitting and experiencing the Oscar night uh, on a tablet, that's going to be very different than having only a mobile phone and being caught in a big snowstorm. And so being able to shape the experience uh, according to the content that you have, I think is also going to be one of the areas that, uh, that the, uh, the development uh, will have to take into mind, into account. Um, one other thing I was going to mention about, uh, about mobile is that uh, mobile curation is one of the areas that we're doing some work on right now where uh, you, know, you, don't, you may not necessarily even have the time to get to a full big computer and you need to curate from the field. And so for us, this is something else that we're working on right now. 
Okay, Bef before giving again the, the floor to the, to the audience, I, will, uh, I would like to take the example of the Boston, last week Boston events, in the sense that uh, uh, live blogging was, uh, was used by everybody, any platform, any, uh, any media organization made its own live blogging. And what, what appeared, because we are in the US, so and the engagement is, is very high, is that you can uh, read on Reddit, you can read on uh, Twitter, uh, maybe the, ter uh, the terrorist is my neighbor, maybe the terrorist is uh, just uh, the home close, close to, my, uh, to, to my house. And uh, so I think one of the major uh, problem we have now with live blogging is about not only fact, checking, but uh, you have now so many people using social media that you can denounce your neighbor, you can uh, manipulate the information. So how do you, um, is curation uh, becoming more important or, or, or not? And how could you solve uh, this, this issue if it is a real problem according to you. I mean, yeah, yeah of course. And, and I mean, as you may or probably know, um, during those hectic hours when we were trying, when everyone was trying to figure out who the bombers were, you know, there were some self-appointed folks on Reddit and other, elsewhere who, you know, called out quite um, infamously now, people who were absolutely not responsible for this. They got it dead wrong. Uh, now, having said that, uh, Reddit certainly does not have a monopoly on getting it dead wrong. CNN had a really rough outing. Uh, we reported things that ultimately proved not to be true. Um, so uh, I think I think it's it's more important than ever. But you know the the we were talking about this at a panel yesterday. What I think live blogging and other sorts of tools provide for an organization like the New York Times is an opportunity to respond quickly, to correct facts, to correct things that we might have gotten wrong, to, to be present, but not necessarily first. I don't think people come to the New York Times because they know we're going to be first all the time. Racing to be first, I think, is, is foolish in this, in this era where a scoop lasts about 36 seconds on the web. It just truly, it just does. Uh, now, I think that the, the value that, an that a site like New York Times can provide is trust and accuracy. And if we don't have those two things, uh, we're dead. So, yes. From Larry, uh, curation, is curation becoming more important in uh, this it, live blogging uh, It is, of course, of course it is. I, uh, uh, I must tell you frankly, I mean, I'm, now I'm, I, I, I take my uh, Grupo Espresso hat, hat off and I'm speaking like, you know, an analyst, you know. Uh, uh, the, uh, as Aaron was saying, uh, uh, social media and are not, have not the only ones who get things wrong. We know that perfectly well in this country. Uh, traditional media have, have been getting things wrong for a long, long time. And uh, the problem is what the new environment can teach us and help us do is to uh, face it and uh, accept, acknowledge that we may be wrong just as much as the others can. So uh, we should perhaps, uh, of course, we are curating and we should be do be doing more of that, and of course we will be creating with as much uh, editorial wisdom as we can uh, have, uh, but we should uh, try and apply the same wisdom to our own, uh, may I use the word broadcast that you used before in these cases, uh, and, and actually plainly correct stuff that when we understand that, we got it wrong. I'd like to mention also from a technical standpoint, one of the areas that uh, is uh, being led 
uh, by internews is an area of citizen news verification. There's actually a Google gl a group uh, that is working toward a citizen journalism verification standard. We're participating in this along with internews and Storyful and Medan and a number of other players in the space. And uh, the idea is to try to create a set of rules by which especially for citizen journalism, you can assign a score of believability that would be the output of this type of algorithm um, to help give an editor uh, at least a little bit of uh, guidance on whether or not uh, a post coming from the public is believable or not. And that's a little different than a report that's coming from a staff member that's erroneous, but I, the same mechanisms can be used there as well. So, uh, the, it, the Google group is called News Verification, and you can check that out on, on the uh, Google groups as well. Okay, so uh, still 10 minutes uh, remaining for questions. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to, to address uh, the problem of uh, uh, technological issues and commercial, uh, commercial opportunities. Uh, so, it will be one question and then uh, uh, the, the audience will have the floor. Uh, if the traffic is 10 times more uh, during those events, so uh, the trend will be to, to say, the trend will be really to set up more and more live blogging sessions. So do you consider that the news organization, because they need more traffic, they need more, uh, more presence on the web, uh, is there a trend for more and more live blogging, or do you will find some blockages, some uh, uh, restraints for, for that? So I would say that for live events and for big breaking news events like Boston, people are gonna turn to the New York Times they're gonna read stories, they're gonna look at, at photos, they're gonna look at the live blog. I wouldn't say that the live blog itself is necessarily the thing that's driving the traffic, although a live blog and a breaking news event and a breaking news moment is going to be where people go quite naturally. Um, I would say though, uh, on the commercial side, we actually have had quite a bit of success um, with, uh, Monetizing, I hate that word, so I apologize to everybody. Why, uh, why? Eh, it's such a terrible word. Um, we've had great success, sorry, monetizing. Uh, our, uh, getting some, revenue. some, huh? Getting revenue? Getting <laughs> revenue, thank you. Uh, on some of our live blogs, like the Oscars, that one does really, yeah, really yeah. well. Tiffany, yeah. Tiffany. But, and I'll tell you the secret, as long as it doesn't leave this room, and we all have to be, <laughs> and we all have to be friends here, because I'm gonna get in big trouble if you tweet this in any language but Italian, because I know nobody in New York is gonna know what the hell I'm talking about if you do. But, um, if you call it a live blog, advertisers will run away from you as fast as they can. But, if you take that very same thing, you put a ballot on it, you put some live video at the top, and a really cool little Twitter module, and you call it a dashboard, <laughs> all of a sudden, they're like, wow, I wanna sponsor that. Uh, so, we actually have done pretty well. We did one for the Super Bowl that did extremely well this year, um, like high six figures well. Again, be, be kind, do not tweet that, do not tweet that, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at everybody out there, be nice to me. Um, uh, and, and the Oscars does very, very well every year. Um, so we've had some success, but you have to kind of package it in a way that makes it more than just a live blog. One thing, yes, one glass. thing that we've worked on, on, on that is uh, also putting advertising inside of the live stream. Um, so again, if you own your platform, you can actually own how the ads and how the, the, the advertiser content is being sent to you. Um, one of our clients is in Basel in Switzerland and uh, one of the things that they, you know, yesterday Basel had a match, a football match, and we were joking about having every goal sponsored by a beer maker. So, you know, this goal sponsored by Carlsberg. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so, but the, the point there is that, you know, you can put things into the live, uh, into the live coverage as well. 
but you have to own the platform in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and when uh, there is no goal, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the, 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 you know, the fans of the uh, opposing team would be gladly going to drink beer <laughs> next time. You know, I doubt about it, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not private to that kind of stuff. So I, I really uh, don't know. I, uh, what I know, generally speaking, is what Aaron was saying that sponsorships are the best ways to uh, um, get money out of it. And uh, but uh, you know, generally speaking, we should never, never, ever forget in what kind of uh, business we are. I mean, in what kind of professional business we are. Uh, we are in, a, in, in the business of telling people what's happening, right? So uh, first we try to do that as well as we can in as much as our, uh, you know, the people who like to refer to us uh, want us to be. Uh, then, of course, we have to try to find ways to uh, pay our salaries at least, and uh, uh, and everything, uh, and, uh, and we have to look about that. But if, and I'm pretty sure that this is one tool that has to be used. I mean, live blogging. If uh, the tools are there and people uh, like them and uh, enable us to tell our stories uh, well, we should use them. Okay, so you can uh, understand uh, that uh, live blogging it, it's still it is still hearts and crafts. We are defining wh wh what what it is. You have the very big organizations, but in the same time uh, you have sophisticated uh, software. Uh, but in the same time, uh, we are inventing. Uh, 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 Sandy uh, was a step. Uh, at the Boston bombings w w was another step. You change your mind. It's evolving. So there is nothing I in the marble. Uh, and and uh, that is, is the interesting story with uh, uh, live blogging. So one question, uh, uh, one here and one here. They, they are coming with a microphone. Hi, I'm from Scribble Live, as you, as you guys all know. Ah. Um, one thing, it's about monetization, about revenue, that live blogging is different from static articles, is the engagement time, how people stay on page much, much longer. So while in a static article, people would go, maybe read an article, maybe read a, po a portion of it, and move away. With a live blogging model, it's more, it's closely associated to the broadcast model, where people stay on page, 50 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and you know, however long the story is running. Um, at Scribble Live, as an average, across all our clients, and you know, we have we have quite a few. It's between 12 and 14 minutes, and this is obviously you have sporting events which are much longer, and people know they're coming, so people go on uh, will go on on page for longer. Um, but also you have the events that people come in and out. So on average, it's a very, very long time in, in internet. So in terms of live blogging, that's commercially, I think that's what really changes. And you know, calling a dashboard and putting things that engage people for longer, that's where you can successfully monetize, with apologies, um, live blogging. Thank just you. By coincidence, is, uh, I, w I wanted to make the same point that Casimir just made. Um, because what we are competing for right now is not only people's money, but I think is uh, people's attention and time, uh, where we have an audience that uh, get is information from, uh, you know, <laughs> mainly from Facebook and from social network, and not, not only from us, um, big outlets. Uh, our uh, focus is to offer the complete experience and to offer the news in the most beautiful way we can. I think that one of the key words is beautification of, of news. Is, um, what is beautification it? of beautification. the news. <laughs> um, I mean, a page um, like the one at the Oscars, but also a page of uh, a real service like the one you did for Sandy, or a page that we did, pages that we did with the, uh, through Scribble Live, offering um, multi multimedia 
contents and uh, uh, contribution from the uh, readers are uh, also um, engaging um, uh, viewing experiences where people want to stay longer and longer and that I think is very appealing. Um, and uh, that's, that's probably the future. I, I want to add uh, about the language um, uh, thing that is very important, I think. Um, what we do is to create uh, a unique file where, where at the end of the day, we have also the um, wrap up of the story uh, under the same link. So you have the, the history, the scribble live of the day, and a uh, short uh, story that is also the article that will uh, remain on, uh, uh, on Google <laughs> uh, as the, again, the complete experience. Uh, may, may I add just one little note of caution for it on the editorial side, th of the management of the editorial side, uh, especially small organizations. When you decide to go live for an event, be sure that you have enough resources, I mean time, people, to follow through. I mean, a, a soccer match, it's 90 minutes, all right? So, you know, that's how long it's going to be. Uh, a pre the election of the President of the Republic in this country uh, took much, 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 much longer than we thought, all right? So uh, you open up your live blogging in the morning thinking that perhaps in a couple of days it will be over, so yes, we can uh, handle that. Then it runs into the weekend. Are you going to close it before the President is elected? Of course not. So there is, uh, uh, this is a great tool. You have to think wisely when and how to use it. Uh, and one more question, but it will be the last one. And uh, three weeks ago, you had in the, in the same time on The Guardian, so Guardian News and Media, on The Guardian website, four different live blogs running together, running to, one was a, a, a earring at the parliament, another a, foot, a, so a football match, another one about politics, so uh, at, uh, it's not on, only the problem how to run one live blogging, but at, at the Guardian, so a big newsroom, a, big, a very important newsroom, they, they, they run uh, several live blogs uh, at, at the same period, the same day. So it's, it's really becoming more and more important. One more question. I said uh, you, you are asking the last question. I just um, more making a point. Um, I'm a live blogger myself. I've uh, been live blogging for ages now. And uh, the challenge is for, for newsrooms if there is like something happening like the presidential elections and the Boston manhunt last Friday, for the first time after months, despite myself being a live blogger, I was trying to follow the, the news on two live blogs instead of Twitter of two organizations, uh, which I'm not going to mention here, because I was just tired of the, the whole buzz and the whole like, confusion you get on Twitter. Yeah. I just want a reliable source of information I can just yes. follow. Even with a couple of seconds of minutes of delay, but some accurate information, I think that is the challenge. Still traffic away from Twitter or from other, uh, other news, um, social media, which in the first place stole that from newspapers. If you can make, if you're able to do that kind of multimedia narration, people st will start trusting you. It will take months, but people will start to acknowledge that and come eventually. Boy, I just could not agree with uh, more with everything you said. I, you know, if you were following Twitter as I was, it was almost impossible to get anything worthwhile out of Twitter during those moments of absolute just frenzy. And, and again, this goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier about the role of news organizations like the New York Times, like sort of traditional news organizations, is we have this opportunity to be the place where people go to kind of help filter through that stuff and just sort of like separate the signal and the noise a little bit. I could not agree with you more. Okay, so I was asked by Christopher Porter to close in time. Uh, we are five minutes late. Uh, so that's the end of this session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.